as you can probably tell right off the bat, um, I, am, I am not a woman, but I am here speaking uh, at She Media's panel. So my hope is, is to be, uh, nor am I a therapist, a clinician, or an Instagram tantra teacher. I'm, I'm a neuroanthropologist and student of peak performance. So really this, this work really just came up in an ongoing quest and search for understanding how our bodies and brains affect our hearts and minds. And if you follow that inquiry to its logical conclusion, and you're not squeamish, and you don't flinch, you end up in one of two places, sexy biohacking or nerdy kink. So, so that's what we're here to talk about. So, so the majority of everything I'm sharing this afternoon comes from this, this most recent book I wrote, Recapture the Rapture. And it was really an inquiry into three things. What is the state of the world? Like, how are we dealing these days in what many researchers and specialists are calling the poly crisis? Right? It's not just one thing that's going off the rails. It feels kind of like everything's going off the rails. You look at climate and ecosystem viability. You toggle over to culture wars and the fracturing of democracy. You look at geopolitics, macroeconomics. You're like, what on earth is going on? And how can we heal ourselves fast enough to get back to full strength so that we can all step up to play our needed parts in writing this ship and in forging a future, as Joanna Macy, the grandmother elder and Zen teacher, has said, we, the people of the passage, this is our time, this is our responsibility, but we can't do it if we're fractured, if we're fragmented, if we're traumatized. So that's what really this story is about and on behalf of, is doing our level best to do something along the lines of Buckminster Fuller's injunction, which is how can we make the world work for all of us, right? all of humanity, through spontaneous cooperation in the shortest possible time without ecological offense or disadvantage to anyone. So yes, this is somewhat titillating content. It's all, we obviously all have a vested interest in this kind of, in these themes and ideas, but really it's on behalf of this. How do we wake up to what is ours to do? How do we grow up and mend where we're broken and how do we show up on behalf of our children's children? So in taking a look at that, right, this kind of this meaning crisis and where are we these days, some of our colleagues at the Harvard Design Lab basically were really fascinated by the question, what does belief look like? What does religiosity look like for the millennial and Gen Z cohorts, right? After organized and institutional religions are falling away, what are the nutrients? What are the deficiencies? How do we go about making sense of this human condition, especially today? with all of its complexity and accelerating rates of change. And they really kind of boiled it down to three things because they found that people who believe in a, people who are, um, I would say, people of faith, right, active in some participatory institutional religion, right, are healthier, wealthier, and happier than people who don't. And the really interesting thing they came across was it doesn't, you, the belief system doesn't matter. It's not what you believe. It could be Krishna, it could be Buddha, it could be Jesus, right? It could be Lemurians or Pleiadians, doesn't matter. What does matter is not what you believe, it's that you believe. And they found that these were the three things, the notion of a beyond, awe, some contemplation of something bigger than us, becoming the ability to grow and heal over time, to step into the fullness of our being and belonging, connectedness community, tribe, family. And you can kind of blow this out a little bit and you can say, okay, let's translate that. It's basically what do we need and what does coming together around peak states and deep healing do for us? It offers us these things, healing, inspiration, and connection. If you go back to the ancient Greeks, they always, they have the best words for everything, second only to kind of, no, I would say they beat the Germans, but Germans have good words for stuff as well, right? Schadenfreude, Weltschmerz, all these kind of things, but the Greeks nailed it. And so ecstasis, catharsis, and communitas. So we're gonna take a look, you, let's see if you can see, yeah, you can. So if you take a look at some of the peak states, the tools that get us into peak states, if you combine sexuality, psychedelics, music and dance, and intensive meditative respiration, Bob's your uncle, you get prayer. 
embodied kinesthetic somatic prayer and spiritual experience. If you bring over from the connection side, let's focus on for today the romantic, which leads to the familial, right? And if you look over at the, the healing opportunities that come, the near-death experience down at the bottom, the NDE. What can happen? The French even have a term for this when they talk about a very a totalizing orgasm. They call it la petite mort, the little death. And it is literally a full recalibration of our nervous systems, right? Thinking, neurosis, inner critic all go offline, and we get to come back to zero, zero on the grid. We just get to power back up from a, from a steady point. So we're going to put all these together and see what there is to be seen. But before we do that, we need to make sure that this is a safe space for you and also for me, right? So we need to figure out who's in the room. Because when we're talking about this stuff, right, it always gets filtered through the lenses of our culture, our upbringing, and our personality. And in doing research in access to all of these states, we, I, I noticed there were sort of three different categories of people who would ask questions in the audience afterward, who would come up and talk, who would sort of engage in trainings. And it was fundamentally the hedonist, the conformist, and the purist. Right? So we're going to play a kind of fun board game. I'm going to describe them to you, and then we're all going to do a quick flash poll survey as to who we have in the room. And it's different every time. So I'm kind of fascinated to see what South By does circa 2023. So the first is the hedonist. Their, their core identity is the sensation seeker. They want to experience it all. The conformist is the rule follower. The purist is the identity protector. All right? The catchphrase might be, if it feels good, do it. Right? That's the hedonist. Hell yes. The conformist would be if it's what the doctor ordered. Right? I'll do anything if it has a prescription attached. And the purist, my body is my temple. I think, having said that, I think I might know where, which way this goes. Let's see. But they also are missing things, right? So the hedonist is missing brakes. They're all just rocket ships, right, shooting off at full velocity. The conformist needs steering, right? They just kind of trundle along on the railroad tracks of consensus opinion. They never veer or steer. And the purist might need an accelerant. They might need a little bit more of a kick in the pants because those cacao sound baths and their breath work just might not be getting them as far as they like to think. <laughs> right? Substance of choice. Right? Cocaine, champagne, and reefer. Muddy Waters 101. Right? The conformist, Ambien, Adderall, and alcohol. Add clonopin, add in a whole bunch of other things. Things that we now know have massively deleterious effects but again came with a prescription or available over the counter, so lack of questioning. Right? And for the purist. <laughs> now, not only are they having missing links, they've got Achilles' heels. So the challenge for the hedonist who wants to suck the marrow out of life and has no brakes to pump, right, can end up veering into addiction. It can be chemical addiction, it can be sexual addiction, it can be addiction to extreme risk taking and action sports, which we see a lot in our community. Right? That's the trouble. They get hooked on the high and they don't know how to self regulate. The conformist, it's compliance. They literally cannot break out of consensus opinion and question for themselves. And for the purist, it's pride, right? That sense of, of this, that I am cultivating a life, a body, a lifestyle that is superior. Now, if you try and intervene with any of these folks, they've all got resistance. So the hedonist, right, is naturally going to say, you're not the boss of me, I get to do what I want. Right? The conformist, if they did try and step out of that ruts of consensus opinion, they'd be like, oh my gosh, who would I be if I did that? Never mind reading Fifty Shades of Grey on your Kindle at this kid's soccer game. <laughs> right? And the purist, ah, it's all cheating. I don't need those crutches. You might. Right? But there's something else here, which is at the bottom, that each of these have an intelligence. They all have a genius. They are all adaptively functional. Right? So the hedonist, what's the good thing, the value, right? the dignity of hedonism? It's, I want to suck the marrow out of life. Right? I want to die leaving no stone unturned. The conformist is, you know what? I, I don't know all of this complex stuff, and I defer to the advice of evidence and experts. And then the final one, the purist, I value the sanctity of my mind and my body. I don't want to pollute it, corrupt it, disrupt it, right? So can we just see for a moment 
each of these categories having real intelligence as well as lopsided weak spots. So now let's do our straw poll. Everybody close your eyes like in second grade. Right, now you can keep your eyes open. You can keep your eyes open, but hedonists in the audience, raise them high and proud. All right, you bunch of derelicts. All right. <laughs> Conformists, the folks that really value the advice of experts and do what is best practice, okay? And purists. That's it. Wow, hedonist by a landslide. <laughs> All right. So the invitation, right, is how can we take the genius of each, minimize the downsides of all, and pull them together into a fourth way, becoming hedonic engineers. And Robert Anton Wilson, who was a funny-ass writer, friend of Tim Leary and, and, and a bunch of others back in the 70s, he said, hedonic engineering is the act of intelligence studying intelligence to improve itself. Why be dumb, depressed, and agitated when you can be smart, tranquil, and happy? So that's the invitation for all of us. All right, so this is basically a story in three parts. Okay, part one, we want to talk about evolution and its role and impact on our sexuality. And just to kind of decouple ourselves from being in it and living it, you know, do I get a Valentine's card in grade school? Do I get a date to the high school prom? What happens by the dashboard light in college? And, and you know, swiping rights and lefts and ups and downs, right? Moving out of that and really taking a look at this from an evolutionary psychological and evolutionary biological point of view. And the idea here is that evolution is a moral. It does not care for our desires and preferences, right? Number two, humans are exceptional. In the category of all animal biology, we are the absolute outlier freaks and misfits, but we wouldn't know because it's our lived experience as humans. And then finally, once we understand that evolution is pulling strings we didn't know we had tied up to us, and that we are unique in the animal kingdom for our actual particular expression of our sexuality, how it works and what we can do with it, then the question becomes, now what is possible? Right, to really put this deliberately to use rather than being danced like puppets on the string of an indifferent process. So this is the first one. I'm just gonna do a couple of a couple of readings uh, from, from this book because I you know, put some thought into saying it concisely here and I probably won't get better elsewhere. Um, but let me just, I'll just start with this one. In 1999, the Bloodhound Gang released a novelty song, Bad Touch, that went where anthropologists and psychologists were afraid to go. Their catchy lyrics put human courtship back within the broader context of love in the animal kingdom. The tune struck a chord, rocketing to the top 10 charts worldwide and getting sampled by the rapper Eminem. You and me, baby, ain't nothing but mammals, so let's do it like they do on the Discovery Channel. <laughs> Getting horny now. <laughs> but really, the Bloodhound Gang should have watched a little more Discovery Channel before they penned their pickup lines. After all, have you seen how animals have sex? It's brutal. Ducks practically drown each other in their efforts. The male mounts the female, wings beating, crushing her underwater until the deed is done. Leave the cooing to the turtle dubs. Ducks, fuck. <laughs> Dogs hump frantically but can get tied up and twisted on the dismount. Stuck facing backwards for hours, they have to wait sheepishly until the swelling goes down and they can both be on their way. But the big cats, the cats have it maybe worst of all. Lions, for instance, only mate every couple of years in the wild. When they do, they make up for lost time, copulating up to 50 times in a 24-hour window. And it's not because they like it. The male's penis has over a hundred tiny barbs on it, which gouge the vaginal walls of the lioness. The spikes serve two purposes, to scrape out any competing semen from prior males and to stimulate ovulation in the female. Fun comes in a distant third. When Thomas Hobbes wrote in Leviathan that the life of man was nasty, brutish, and short, he could just as easily have been thinking of love in the animal kingdom. Sex, for the overwhelming majority of animals, is violent, dangerous, and brief. There's barely a lick of enjoyment for anyone involved. So 
So this is how we're wired, right? We are wired to come together passionately and powerfully to copulate, exchange genetic material, to gestate and deliver a child, and then evolution whoosh, says, have another go at it. So typically, we think of love as kind of a, you know, an amorphous, um, open-ended concept, but this is drawing from Helen, Dr. Helen Fisher's work. She's a Kinsey Institute researcher. She's now the chief science officer for Match.com, so she does all kinds of fascinating work on giant million-person data sets. And she's kind of broken it down to the progression of the neurochemistry. So basically what happens is it progresses in three phases. So lust is just purely hormonal testosterone, testosterone and estrogen. That is the desire to mate and connect. If over time you get into the next phase of kind of pair bonding, so you've gone from kind of one night stand or initial connection, and now you're in the heady stages of romance, losing your mind, like punch drunk, you're into the attraction. Dopamine gets excreted during climax and pair bonds. Serotonin plummets. It actually, some researchers believe it's the closest to OCD. So obsessive compulsive disorder is that we become obsessive about our mates. We can't think about anybody else. We're doodling hearts in our notebook in class instead of paying attention, all that kind of stuff, right? And then perhaps you can, you can progress into long-term pair bonding and attachment. So the oxytocin and the vasopressin. And if you take a look at it, this is, this is kind of the, the modes and the brain region, right, where all of these things are happening. But what happens is too much and too little regularly overclock our processes, right? So, so, so much of that, too much of the dopamine and the oxytocin, we end up in that kind of hedonist trap of almost addictive behaviors, binge eating, drug abuse, irrational behavior, adultery, jealousy. They're, they're ramping us up, and we can't control or steer it. Ideally, we connect, we bond, we stay together, but evolution doesn't care. So a few examples of that, right? A classic one these days is a woman on hormonal birth control, right? Which, which, which completely changes her neurochemistry and leads her, tricks her body and therefore her brain, and consequently, her heart and mind into feeling like what I really want is a safe, secure, it basically kicks her from the lust stage down into the attraction attachment stage. So she might find a really nice, sensitive new age guy. And she's like, you're gonna be a perfect father to my children. You're a good, safe provider. You see me, respect me, and appreciate me. Let's get hitched. They get hitched, and then she's like, yay, now's a good time in our life. I'm gonna go off the pill. Let's start thinking about a baby. And she's like, what? <laughs> Who's this spineless little milk toast boy with, with the dad bod and the hipster mustache? You're not doing it for me, son, right? And this is the, this is the classic, right? And, she, and she, this is the classic of the yoga retreat, right, where, where the women are slipping off to the bar to like hook up with the biker guys and all the yoga guys are like, what's going on, right? That happens. Like dirty, dirty trick. She wants, she wants a strong-jawed alpha male for a super shag. And when they do, Right? And this is, this, is, this is the evolution is amoral bit, right? When a woman has an orgasm with a new virile partner, her ovulation cycle can slide up to 72 hours in either direction. So you're like, oh, so evolution is like, we will grab that new genetic material, right? And we will make a new, we will make new life with it, right? On the other side of the fence, right, the classic is men in the 40s. This Paul Simon sung about this a while ago, like, why am I all soft in the middle when the rest of my life is so hard, right? So guys come into that era, they, they, their, their recovery from workouts starts slowing down, their mental acuity doesn't. Again, dad bods, things that used to be up here, start finding themselves down here, what's going on? And wouldn't you know it, like right on time, and the French, those horny bastards, right, have a name for all this stuff, l'affaire la de la quarantaine, the affair of the 40s. Right, right on time, they've even got a name for it, right? And he goes off and bangs the intern because, right, and it feels like a million bucks. And he's like, honey, baby, I'm so sorry. I just got the heart wants what it wants. And you're like, no, 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 that's, de that's declining testosterone, bro. <laughs> and, and, right, one of the surest fire ways to, in, to boost testosterone is sex with a newer and younger viable partner, right? So you're like, oh my God. Right? So we can kind of see this stuff. Even, even the initial love and lust phase, are like, oh, we were tearing our clothes off each other, we couldn't get enough of each other, then we had kids, now we've got two kids under the age of three, we just feel like roommates, what the hell happened? 
right? All of that is just this evolutionary cycle. And evolution does not care about us standing up in front of our friends and family and saying, till death do we part. It doesn't care about honor, cherish, and obey. It doesn't care about, I'm gonna be with you, you know, through thick and thin. All it cares about, right, is robust genetic material. So can we just kind of give ourselves a moment and just appreciate how much of our personal lives, how much of like what, what Dr. Jennifer was just talking about, right, the actual situation with pregnancy, conception, sexual education for our children, the health and viability of our learning and our communities and our families, how much of our heartache and heartbreak is just driven by these utterly impersonal forces. It's not our fault, right? We're just along for the ride, right? So just, you know, just sort of bear witness, right, to what a crazy situation this is that so much of our interior experience, we like to think we're in control, right? We like to think that we're in charge of our destinies. And everything I just described, I mean, you know, raise your hand if none of that has any relation to any, you know, any of your own lived experience or any movies, books, or literature you've ever heard, right? I mean, this is our story, right? And it's funny, we laugh because it's so familiar. But on the other hand, what can we do about it? And this is actually just one additional one. This is just a public service announcement. Um, <laughs> Right? It's not that men are from Mars and women are from Venus, it's that women are lunar and their cycle is 28 days, surprise, surprise, to no one in this audience. But men are solar, they're diurnal, they operate on a 24 hour cycle. Right? And if you, if you mismatch these, you won't know what's going on. So most couples make love when they have time, you know, especially if you're in a stabilized relationship, typically at the end of the day when all responsibilities, especially for, you know, for young parents, et cetera, and, that is, you know, and no attention to the woman's ovulatory cycle. It's either just completely suppressed with birth control or you know, guys, at the very least, are just clueless. So, you know, so <laughs> there are two points in a day where a man is at peak testosterone. One is, surprise, surprise, first thing in the morning. So that's quote unquote morning wood, right? That's the time where if, where if a woman is interested in passionate but not particularly relational sexual connection with her partner, and again, this is all cis-heteronormative, so anybody who has any other experience of who you love and how you love, please just transpose the obvious elements, right? But that is a time when a man is rearing to go but doesn't have a lot of relational oxytocin, vasopressin, those kind of things. There's another peak at around one to two in the afternoon of testosterone, hence the song Afternoon Delight, right? Skyrockets in flight. In fact, you know, PSA would be for anybody if you can time your lovemaking for morning or afternoon versus end of the day, because by the end of the day, the man's testosterone has dropped off a cliff, and a woman, if she's particularly been in any of kind of the dual labor traps, right, of just giving, 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 and working on, you know, home, home and professionally, is done. And if you use alcohol as your mood shifter slash libido enhancer, you're stuffed. So if anybody is having subpar sexuality over time in a long-term relationship and your predominant mode or time frame of making love is after eight or nine in the afternoon and alcohol is ever in the mix, just know it, it's going to suck. <laughs> Guaranteed. If you're getting laid at all, you're killing it. Back off those things, schedule mornings and afternoons as your world will change radically. And again, a lot of PSA for the, for the men in the audience, if you ever like rocked your lady's world a couple of weeks ago and you try to go come back with your signature moves and she's just not feeling it, and you're like, what happened? I don't understand. Ovulatory cycle. If you look at that line, day 14 in the middle, that is, that is at a time where a woman has peak estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone, and is much more open and available to the kind of passionate romps that everyone would sort of, you know, hopefully have in their repertoire. So men, pay attention to this. If you want to schedule dirty weekends with a partner, if you want to leave the kids at home with grandma or a safe babysitter, right, it's that weekend. <laughs> Just go all in once a month. <laughs> all right. All right. Oh, I feel we're loose now. We're, we're, in, we're in the room. Um, now let's talk about us. All right, let's talk about humans because and I just didn't realize this. I started researching Jared Diamond, who folks will probably remember from his Pulitzer winner, Guns, Germs, and Steel. But he also wrote a book, a deceptively titled called Why Sex is Fun. The book itself was not fun. It was, it was the dullest book about sex I've ever read. But <laughs> he had some fascinating things in it. And the first, the first was this, which is, um, this is a strange little critter 
called a homunculus, and this particular one was designed by Wilder Penfield, who's one of the kind of godfathers of neuroscience, and really kind of got one of the first to get into the neuroanatomy of what makes our brains do different things at different times. And he basically designed this little creature to reflect how sensitive we are in different body parts. So basically, if we were sort of, if different parts of ourselves were the size of the number of neurons in those areas, this is kind of what it would look like. Big lips and tongue, right? Facial, huge amount of connectivity in our face and tongue. Enormous amounts in our hands, also in our feet. And then he kind of, he undersold, this was I think in the 50s, so, so out, of, out of modesty, he misrepresented the junk, right? Actually, that would be the highest concentration of nerve endings in a, in a male's body, 7,000 neurons in his penis. But a woman has them hands down. And if anybody has already studied this stuff, you might have heard the, the, the sort of notion that a woman's clitoris has 8,000 nerve endings. So, so a much smaller accessible area, right, with a much higher concentration than the man's. Recent research that came out six months ago um, is actually saying that that's an undercount for women and that it's potentially anywhere from 12 to 14,000 <laughs> nerve endings in the clitoris. And again, for apologies for all the women, this is somewhat remedial, but this is just doing, doing the boys a favor here. If you haven't seen all the anatomical models of a woman's clitoris with that beautiful wishbone structure that, you know, it, it, it's a larger, more complex organ than a, than a man's. And the fact is, is that we haven't had those little models up until the 1990s, the mid-90s, was the first time that stuff was discovered. Think about that. We put, we put humans on the moon and we learned to split atoms and make stars, and we hadn't figured out the most sensitive and complex organ essential to human procreation until the mid-90s, the very end of the 20th century. That is just boggling, right? So here's a little bit just on the exceptionality of our human sexuality. And that's what's so fascinating about our own sexual habits, how thoroughly different they are from those mammals on the Discovery Channel. And this is a quote. All these features of human sexuality, long-term sexual partnerships, private sex, concealed ovulation, extended female receptivity, sex for fun, constitute what we humans assume is normal sexuality, Diamond explains. But that proves to be a speciesist interpretation by the standards of the world's 4,300 other species of mammals, and even by the standards of our own closest relatives, the great apes, we are the ones who are bizarre. We're among only a handful of animals on the entire planet who have sex outside of a narrowly defined window of fertility. Sure, dolphins and bonobos do sometimes, but they're two of the most intelligent species on the planet. Their friskiness only strengthens the linkage between elective sexuality and complex cognition. But even they lack many of the other factors that render human sexuality so distinctive, like concealed ovulation and frequent female orgasm. Animals ignore their sex drives until they're briefly consumed by them. But humans think and act on their impulse anytime, all the time. Most women, unless they're on the pill or using a fertility app, don't know for certain when they are in estrus a simple fact of life that cows and baboons readily understand. Men definitely can't tell when their potential mates are ovulating and experience high sex drive and a desire to copulate year round. Women mostly humor them. So this is, um, this is our situation. Right? We are anomalous in the animal kingdom. And if anybody, anybody heard of Terence McKenna, he was kind of a psychedelic bard. He, he, you, know, you, you can see him sampled in Electronica and you know, all over YouTube. But he basically coined a, a, a theory called the stoned ape theory of to how did we get to complex cognition? How really, really recently, just a few hundred thousand years ago, did we go from just gathering around on the savannah and hunting and gathering to suddenly being homo sapiens? And so his theory was that we went, you know, followed game herds to hunt and picking, you know, uh, insects and things out of the dung, et cetera, and came across mushrooms. And then we ate the mushrooms. And then the mushrooms, da, 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 you know, kind of powered us up into complex cognition, right? And, and that was a funny theory back in the 90s. No one really agreed with it. It's kind of seen a resurgence lately as the psychedelic renaissance has kind of lifted that back to the fore. But I would think that actually that's a tenuous theory, and it's impossible to prove retroactively. 
But a much more plausible theory is that this really unique expressions of our sexuality, right, the ability to radically shift state for extended periods over time with evolution throwing the kitchen sink at the incentives and every single human on the earth didn't have to find some esoteric mushroom that might kill you but didn't, she showed you God instead, right? Instead of that, like finding this hu you know, hugely rewarding, highly incentive, ultra portable adjunct to the evolutionary imperative and that it's that capacity, the horned ape, not the stoned ape, right? That brought us to more complex cognition. Because when you look at it, right? In the simplest sense, we are prefrontal cortexes connected to spinal columns, connected to erogenous zones, right? And that capacity to understand this system and this framework is essential to understanding how to hack it and optimize it, not just for healing, right? And not just for wonderful peak states, but also for connection with the people we actually make our lives and raise our families with. Because you can take a look. Is anybody familiar with the vagus nerve? It's kind of having a moment in the last few years, right? He, it starts in the base of the brainstem and goes all the way down through our body, down to our root. So, you know, basically, um, interesting study, I just came across this one this week, was that the, it fires when a mother sees their child, right? It, the high vagal tone increases compassion, connectivity, but it's the same experience fires when you see other people suffering. So like we get, a, we, get a, we, we get a boost of it, right, when we experience connection and compassion, but we also get a boost of it when we see terrible news reports, when you see Turkey and Syria in the earthquake, when you see a homeless person. So it's literally a huge element of our connectivity and caring for each other. And the endocannabinoid system, right, runs through our body. This is 90% of US doctors do not even know about this and recommend this. But if you've ever heard any of the hype and the current legalization, recreation of, of cannabis, it's because of this. Pre-existing in our body is the endocannabinoid system. Again, it pairs mother to child. It's responsible for the runner's high, endorphins are not, right? It also reduces chronic brain injury. The Israeli researchers have found that after concussion, if you have cannabinoids on board within 45 minutes, it massively reduces glutamate firing and TBI activity. And, and researchers at Cornell have found it also ex in increases memory extinction after traumatic events. So basically that if you've had a, a PTSD inducing event and you can experience that the endocannabinoid system will actually help you release and, f and, and put those memories in their appropriate place. So those are all in our system. And what we can do when we learn to use these, right, is we can go from, hey, I mean, how many of us would say we're experiencing micro PTSD right now? Like just the stresses of the last few years, being cooped up and separated and isolated, constant ever on society, notifications, psyche blown out into social media, right? Not enough rest, not enough sunlight, not enough movement, not enough connection, tons of information. Right? We're all suffering from micro PTSD all the time these days. Right? So a healthy sexual fitness right, can help us defrag that, right? release it. This is the whole Robert Sapolsky at Stanford's idea of why zebras don't get ulcers. Right? If you have a way to discharge the stressors and fears of, the, of your life, we have a way to stay aligned and healthy. Then all the way into, you can use, and I'll, I'll tell you this story. So Rick Doblin, who's actually here, he's the founder of MAPS, which is, he's a Harvard uh, PhD and the founder of the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, which has been doing clinical phase three trials to get through MDMA, right, the, the sort of empathogen, uh, MDMA used for PTSD treatment and relief. And it's had incredible results. The, F, the, the DEA and the FDA have been fast tracking it. Uh, it's being used for, um, victims of war, veterans, survivors of domestic and sexual abuse. Um, it's really profound in its capacity to help folks. And I was sitting on a panel a couple of years ago with Rick, and in between, we were just chatting. I was like, tell me your newest research. How's it all going? I, I want to understand wh what you guys are learning. And he said, well, you know, what really feels so powerful about this is that people are able to take their memories off the shelf, the traumatic ones. They're able to revisit them in a safe, saturated state of abundance, connection, security, and then they're able to kind of rework their memories. And they're able to put them back on that shelf and they just, they sit a little differently. They live a little differently. 
right? And he goes, and you know that the closest we found to what's the neurochemistry, like high oxytocin, high vas vasopressin, right, high serotonin, is the post-orgasmic state. And I was like, wait, what? You guys have spent 30 years, 100 million bucks, right, and to, to navigate this crazy lab labyrinth of federal regulation, and you mean to tell me that the outcome is the sort of exalted state known only to research scientists as post-orgasmic, you know, how else could we possibly do that? <laughs> a little faster and a little cheaper with instant access to everyone, right? And then taking it to its conclusion, so this is the sliding scale of sexual fitness. So level one, like just thinking of it like you would any other form of fitness, regular, practiced, intentional, sexual cultivation, arousal, and discharge, defrags my nervous system. Zebras don't get ulcers. I move into the center and I'm like, oh, and once I'm in my body and on time, connected to a practice partner, I can even go back into deeper history, into the bigger hits of my life, and I can reformat those. And if we keep going, we can even enter the numinous, non-ordinary states of consciousness. And Dr. Nicole Prousey, who's at UCLA, conducted a study on 15 minutes of clitoral stimulation for a female-identified partner, and, and over eight weeks found that it outperformed Johns Hopkins psilocybin trials by 6%. Women had more consistent and higher mystical experiences from 15 minutes of clitoral stimulation than from the high-dose mushroom protocols at Johns Hopkins University. Right? There you go. <laughs> All right. So what I'd love to do now is, is wrap with an opportunity for us to have some conversations with each other, really presence this uh, in the room and in our own experiences. So we've understood that evolution is amoral, right? We are puppets dancing on indifferent strings, right? Unless we understand the mechanisms. And we've understood how radically different, right, our own experiences are from the rest of the animal kingdom and therefore what we can do differently ourselves. So if it's okay, we're gonna do a fun breakout discussion, but you please, please hear me when I give you your time switches. So you're gonna find a partner, it'll be the person next to you that you know the least, so not the ones you came with, Okay, and when I, uh, when I, I'm going to give you 60 seconds, so this is no rehearsal, no preamble, first thought, best thought, blurt your answer out, okay? The first one is, my relationship to sexuality as a teenager was, fill in the blank, because, fill in the blank, okay? Begin. You guys ready for the next one? Please, eyes up front, eyes up front. Prompt number two, my most healing or transformative experience with sexuality has been. And this can be celibacy, this can be a solo experience, this can be a partner experience, it can be a dream, right? Feel free to fill it in how you would like. And our final prompt, you guys are doing awesome. This sounds just like Charlie Brown where all the kids go to school, they're like, wah, 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 wah. it's fantastic. All right, final one to bring it home, guys. Prompt number three. If I could live into a sexual relational experience I have not yet had but yearn for, it would be. Go. Oh, quiet now, huh? All right, now please go ahead and thank your partner. Please go ahead and thank your partner for listening, for sharing. And then all eyes up front, we're going to bring this home. All right, so everybody just take a good full breath in and out. All right, so we got to precisely 66% of the talk I had hoped to give today. The rest is, all, is, is, a, is a research study that we did on putting all of these things together and the impact that it had on 12, 10 couples for 12 weeks engaging in deliberate intentional practice and the impact was a reduction in trauma a an increase in connectivity and a heightening of peak states. If anybody would like to look at the in-depth studies, including uh, subject journals and reports, it's at recapturetherapture.com under the tab for studies. Please feel free. But what I'd love to do is just hopefully, just in this brief introduction to this topic from this kind of anthropologist from space perspective, like what do we do, curious monkeys, right? We can feel a little bit more empowered. We can be feel a little less self-conscious. 
We can, we can experience the ups and downs, the triumphs and travails of our lives and loves with a little bit more compassion and a little bit more perspective and that we can understand that in fact, we can be in charge of this and we can reclaim this most central activity right, of human experience and put it towards the healing, the inspiration and the connection we all need. So I'd just like to leave you with just a couple of closing paragraphs uh, from this book. It's helpful to think of hedonic engineering as NC-17, fifth class rock climbing. Definitely not for kids, and the falls can kill you. You wouldn't go wandering up a dangerous mountain without ropes, anchors, and harnesses. If you did, and you hurt yourself, you'd have no one to blame. On the other hand, equip and train yourself and venture humbly into consequential terrain with trustworthy guides and partners, and you'll be rewarded by the satisfaction of the ascent and the view from the top. It's precisely because it has risks that this experience is so rewarding. Once we understand the implications of hedonic engineering, we can tune our consciousness however we choose. We can access the numinous, discharge our trauma, and forge bonds that last a lifetime. To realize that the keys to our cage are the keys to the kingdom is a thrilling, if fearsome, responsibility. But the gates swing wide open now. Our prison is unlocked, and so is the garden. Thank you very much. Thank you.